Them Days, a little magazine published in Happy Valley, a celebration of a way of life that is no more. Trappers, fishermen, hunters tell of experiences in the country and in the fishing boats. They tell what it was like to be a Labradorian years ago in Them Days. Frequently, there are stories printed in Inuktitut and occasionally in the Naskapi Montagnier language. I think what we'll do after this. Stories, after this. diaries, memories, photographs, an ambitious project for a group of people who hadn't any experience in journalism or publishing before. Somehow they made it work. Them Days has been coming out regularly four times a year since 1975. Volunteers really keep the magazine going and there's no shortage of people of all ages who are willing to pitch in to help put Them Days together. It's a reflection, I suppose, of the passionate desire among Labradorians to document and preserve their history, their heritage. Through them days, people such as Aunt Flo Bakey can speak of the Labrador she knew and loved. She's nearly 91 now. Her memories go back to the last century. Aunt Flo is happy to share these memories, especially with the younger generation of Labradorians for they will never do what she's done. They will never live the life that she's lived. Perhaps that's a good thing, for not all memories are pleasant. Life was often a struggle for survival. Yet the young have a right to know, and Aunt Flo has now the privilege to tell what life was like in Labrador in them days. In them days, everybody had a saw pit and a pit saw and all kinds of saw. And it's because they always sawed all their logs and, and made their schooners, their little boats, their canoes, their comedics, their houses, and everything else they needed. Benches or chairs or something and, uh, for their houses. Did you do any hunting or trapping yourself? Yes, I'd be always hunting and having snares, rabbit snares. I always had little trap I got a, I got a mink once up Grand Lake. And I sent it down the rest of her. We just, first year after we went up, I think, and I got this ring. He said, I bought my ring. Oh. I, had a, I had a loan of a ring for Annie Blake's ring, where he got married, which I had married. So I bought that one. That's my ring. And, and I never got no other kind of fur, only weasels and squirrels. But I always got some weasels, some squirrels. And, and always, you did a lot of fishing? Always get rabbits. You did a lot of fishing? Yes, I've been always fishing all my life. Nothing better than fishing. For me, I had haven't been out at all this year. It don't seem to good on my feet. I, you know, if I come to a lump, I'm likely to go right over. And then if it's by myself, I'd be long I'm getting up, I suppose. You were telling me last year how you went out on the ice. Yes. And you had you couldn't get back in. Yes. But I went out after that too, because I put on a pair of old socks over my boots and didn't slip at all. It was good. Labrador, a vast land off the beaten track, where people lived as hunters and fishermen for generations, unheralded, unsung. How much of our past has disappeared, leaving not a trace? What was it like when the settlers first came out? How did they live? And what of our native ancestors, the Inuit, the Nascapi Montagne people, their lives, their customs, their traditions? How many stories are still out there in this big land?
North of Nain, there's an island that towers out of the sea. It's a landmark that can be seen for miles around. It is called Tahaliuk, Iceberg Island. Manus Fox recalls the stories he was told as a child, stories passed down through the generations of things that happened a long time ago, long before the Moravian missionaries, long before the white man. Two shamans who lived here in northern Labrador were competing. Each was trying to prove he had the strongest power, the best magic. Each did wonderful things to show his power, but the shaman who won the competition was the one who took an iceberg that was drifting by the coast and changed it into an island. He shaped it high like it is now and called it Tahaliuk, Iceberg Island. And that's what it's called to this day. And so the stories, the memories, the legends of our native peoples appear too in them days. Stories and photographs bring back memories of an earlier time an earlier way of life. For life has changed for the Inuit too. When the white men came, he had to learn from the ancestors of these people how to survive in northern Labrador, how to fish, how to hunt, how to build sod huts and snow houses. He had to learn about comatics and dog teams. And there were other things the white men learned too, strange, mysterious things. For a long time, Simon Lewisy was owed money for a silver fox. He was finally promised payment when the steamship Harmony came south. When the vessel started to pass on by, he did a remarkable thing. As a boy, John Edmonds was fascinated with this old man. So when she was coming up from north, passing out along by the oily gardens there, she was going on again south. So he still wasn't paid for his fox. So he, he awfully didn't like this too well, you know, and I, and I guess I wouldn't either, eh? Waiting all that time. So anyway, he, he got up on the hill. He said she was going on out, long the guns out for the gull, around the capes. And he said, he said, I'm going to stop her, he said. So he went up on the hill. And why he wasn't up there very long when she stopped out, 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 out between the gull and the, and the, and the oily guns. Stopped her dead on the water. He comes down. He went down and got aboard of his flat. And I say he had about two miles to row out to her. He rowed out, got aboard of her, got paid for his fox. And when he got back in his flat and started to row back, she went on again. Started to go on again then. And I heard father say, the captain said, she just stopped dead on the water. The motor was going, the boat wouldn't make no headway. And he, when he, after he got out of her, she went, went on again. So that's a miracle, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> what did he call that? Well, he call, that, that's what they call it, Ungercook. Ungercook. Yeah, well, the old name is saying it was Ungercook, eh? But I don't know yet what it is, but it was some sort of a way they had doing things. So I asked him one time. I, I was always around the old fella anyway, you know, asking him one thing or another. And, so I asked him, how do you do it? No, I know you have to do things. So I asked him, how do you do with these things? Well, he said, he said, I fight seven devils. He said, before I can do this, he said, I fight seven devils. And uh, you know, that, that's what he tell me, you know, that's how I get out of it, eh? Yeah, I fight seven devils, he said. Uncle Jack, could you tell me about the time the teapot walked downstairs out to Table Bay? Yes. We had a we had our, I don't know what was wrong, but we, our house was built in a bad place or something. Just queer things went on in and all the time. And one night I was going to bed, we had a visitor to the house, Tommy Curl, I dare say you know him. And after all ends had gone to bed, he was laid down on the lounge and covered up for the night. And I started to go up 
upstairs. We had to drop a tea, and I put the teapot back on the oven where it belonged. And when I went to go upstairs, I met the teapot coming down, bumpity bump on the steps. And you know, I thought that was terrible funny, so I took the teapot and I wondered how he'd get there because the oven was right again the stairs and they were wrong to every step of the stairs and I took the teapot and tried to put him through the wrongs. There's near a place there he could go through. But you know, however he come there upstairs, it was a mystery because I just let him go a couple of minutes before he hadn't put him on the oven. And then he, uh, when he, when I was going up, he come down bumpity bump on all the steps. And when he struck the floor, the tea splashed out of him and went up over the door and uh, it stained the wall. And that stain could never come out. Well, one of my friends told me one time he had a he had a bad tent stove, so he had to make a new one. The other one didn't draw very good. So he's going to make one in that would draw right good. You know what I mean? Draw on it and burn good. See? So he put it up in his tilt, and he went out and he cut off a junk of dry wood and made some little stuff like that to start the fire with. And he went out to get more, and he heard the stovepipe rattling. And he looked up, and the wood and the, the candle was coming up through the stovepipe. <laughs> he drawed too good. So he said the only thing he could do then, he couldn't keep the shame of the kindling in the store, so he, he said, oh, a can on the ground, he said. So he cut a notch in the, in the funnel, and he cut the can open, and he shoved it in for what they call the key, eh? You know, let's top the funnel up. Yeah, 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 in there, yeah. And uh, top the funnel up, and he went out again, and he heard the toilet and the store before come up through. <laughs> so and then he said he had to put a damper in the store. Covered the, the little round draft, right? Put something over in there. The only way he could keep wood in his stove, but it stopped, stopped the draft. <laughs> I guess you made your own fun in them days. I guess stories were stretched a bit when Austin Montague and the other trappers met in the country. Them days is liberally sprinkled with sketches of Labrador life. They're done by a local artist and singer, Gerald Mitchell, originally of Makovic. Gerald comes home to sketch and to freshen his memory. His drawings illustrate the stories. And since most happened long before Gerald's time, he's often got to use his imagination to recreate the scenes and events. Yet, even a person of Gerald's age can remember them days, for change has been swift here on the coast of Labrador. Sure, it's only 20 years ago that the schooners disappeared. And the dogs, why, they were a part of life here until a few years ago. The only means of getting about in the wintertime. Every family had a dog team. You had to especially on the northern parts of the coast. Nain is the northernmost community in Labrador these days. Other, more northerly places, Okok, Nutok, Rama, Hebron, have all gone. There's nothing left there at all. The people have scattered all along the coast, living a new life now, the old ways slowly disappearing. There are two or three, though, who scorn the new snowmobiles. They still keep their dog teams, as the Inuit have for centuries. Josaya <laughs> Itulak, he's one of the northern men from the northernmost tip of the Labrador Peninsula. He used to travel around Killinek, near Cape Chidley, and he'd always travel by dog team. He'd wear caribou skins and seal skin clothing to protect him from the cold, and he'd trust to his dogs. They'd go in all kinds of weather, even in blizzards so bad you could only see the harness traces of the dogs in front of the comatic. As long as they knew the route, the trail, if they'd used it only once before, they'd never get lost. They'd take you to where you were going. It was the only way to travel when he was young, and it was the only way the Inuit traveled in the early days. There are only a few dogs left on the Labrador, a reminder of earlier days. 
Days that are remembered well by the old men. There was more to life in them days than hunting and fishing. It took knowledge and skill and ingenuity at home, too. You couldn't dart out to the store whenever you wanted something. Just about everything you needed, you made for yourself. Clothing, furniture, mats, rugs, boots, even soap. Hilda Decker of Hopedale talks about making soap in them days. I used to make a soap out of ashes. <laughs> and uh, I used to take the ashes out of the stove, put it in a pan, yeah. and then and boil the, the strength out of it. And then I'd call it off and I'd put it into another boiler, an amber boiler. And I'd put in a bit of fat into it, seal's fat, put a bit of the palm of your hand. And, but the fat is thick, you know? And you cook it, boil it for a while. And after a while, it's boiling about two or three hours. It, it gets thick. Just as thick that you make it thick as you like. And it'd come out, and you'd stir it with a wooden spoon. Because uh, it's it's cut the other sort of spoons, metal sp a man, you know what it is? Yeah, metal. Yes, yes. And uh, to be and then I called off and I I I cut it off in chunks, little you know, chunks of soap. I used to use it for scrubbing the floors and uh, overhauls mm -hmm. and washing seal skins. And I get a small skin. So it's strong. Yes, it? very strong. But it's good. My mother taught me how to do that because her grandma used to do it. Caribou, seal, partridge, ducks, wild game of all sorts fed generations of Labradorians. And it's still important on the coast. But it was essential in them days and children look forward to following their fathers in the country. I used to always hear my father say about the, the partridges out in the spring of the year, around the middle of the last of April, how plentiful they were out in the barns, and, and how they used to ball in the evening, in the mornings. And the, the, especially the male bird, he would say, come back, come back, come back. And also in the evening, get late in the evening, they would also bother. But in the middle, middle of the day, they wouldn't hear a sound. It was very quiet. And uh, the, I got very interested in it. So I was tormenting my dad and take me in. Well, Leo O'Brien of Lensalou finally had his chance. When he was 14, his father agreed to take him in the country. So they put on their skin boots, harnessed up their dog team, and headed inland to a little tilt way back in the country. There they passed the night, and he waited for his first day on the barrens. And the next morning we left the dog team very early, and uh, on, the, on the edge of a pond there was an otter, and he was up on the ice eating a trout. So the otter saw us, and they disappeared, went into the water. And uh, we went on hunting, and when the snow began to get soft, Dad was always drive to a barren net, and uh, I would lay down on the barren, and the seven dogs around me, and he would put on his snowshoes and travel out there for another couple of hours or so. And then finally we came back around uh, noon, around 12 o'clock, and uh, had lunch, and he said to me, he said, I think he's not going down now, see the, that otter may, may come up again. So Dad, I said, okay. He said, you'll be all right here. I said, yes. He said, you get wood and, and feed the dogs when that back in time. I said, okay. So where you going, Dad? He was gone in a couple of hours. Finally, I looked out to the southern, and I saw the fog coming in, black as could be. The fog come in and then covered in the hills, there was nothing to be seen. I began to wonder, would that get astray? He would come back. Finally, I got worse. And there was a little window in the direction that it was gone. There was an eight by 10 glass into it. So I get up on the bunk, and I started to look, and finally I started to look through the glass and pray. 
And finally, I, I got never looked him back again up on the bunk and looked at it last, pray, cry, everything all mixed up together. I was getting the all in a wonderful way now. I did that for quite a while, and I was getting worse all the time. So I looked down at the hole, I saw one of the dogs down eating the cable. I, no, the first thought came in my mind was to make a dog, dog's ball. But I looked down in the, the pond, I saw this dog eating the cable. And I, I said, you're a ball. So I called the dog up and put the harness on. And just as I was going to come down on the, on the poor old dog, I saw Dad's head bobbing over the whole environment. I let go, let go everything, and rushed in the hill, sat down. This boy was a big fellow. <laughs> the Dad came, he said, I will stay longer, he said, but I said, I got so foggy. He said, I was afraid. He said, that you might get frightened. I said, no, frightened. What are they going to get frightened for? At the same time, <laughs> I was almost frightened. So, uh, anyway, uh, we ended up with uh, just about 100 parachutes. I know one of my, one of my friends long ago had a hard, hard trip in the country. He went in the way of Snickamook River somewhere in there, trapping with another man. I believe his name was Charlie Goldie. And uh, in the trapping, and he come back to his camp, and, he went in for the night, you know, took his clothes and everything off and cooked his supper. I suppose you know what he could in there, and then he, I suppose he must have showed his stove full of dry wood and he fell asleep. And when he woke up, the tail was all ablaze inside. And he didn't know what to do, so he grabbed, he couldn't get to the door, so he took a drunk of wood and threw out the door. The door fell down and, and he brought it out through the flame. Then he got outside, he, he worked at it. He, Kick snow on his towel snow on everything, he deer fit in the snow. I forget what time of the year it is. If it's around Christmas time of the afternoon or somewhere around the late in the coldest part of the season anyway. And, and he, he had, didn't know what to do with He had his, his stuff was all burned up, his clothes, his shoes, and everything all burned, and he had nothing going on his scaffold or anything like that. So we well, that he had to tear off his outside shirt and put it around his wrap around his feet and, <laughs> and put his snow on and go for the next tilt. I think the next tilt was somewhere about two or three miles away. And uh, when he got to the tilt, there was nobody there, the man was gone. And after he did come out, I think the man come in caught in there, and they kicked it all frozen, and they had them thawed, and you know, and suffering, and they got a, had to get out from in there somehow, so. I think the man pulled as far as he could, or done something, and after that they got a, they got a bunch of Indians, come out, someone come out anyway, and, and got a bunch of Indians, a couple of Indians to go in and help to get into the country. And he almost lost. He didn't lose his feet, but he still feels it up to the day he died, you know? He crept on the crept from it. Yeah. Well, that was a quite a hard time, eh? Yeah. The men, they are a rare breed who found great land they fished and trapped the water waves from the coast to far inland their snowshoes streak the endless plains from fall to early spring when they said Traps when they blaze their trails, you could hear their axes ring. Through the stormy winter days, they often went. Yeah. 
spring when they return to their loved ones dear who with happy hearts and shouting were always waiting there you ask them why did gone where no man had gone before it's easy to Explain, sir, the sons of Labrador. Now we don't claim the credit of those men true and bold. Their names are stamped upon this land. Their story. These men, they are our fathers, and we can't ask for more. Their heritage we proudly claim with the sons of land.